Please be seated. When Michael invited me to preach today, then he let me know what the subject was, the topic was. I felt rather like Shane did last week. No, I don't know anything about it. I, don't know little, I know little about fasting, it's not something I necessarily do. However, Shane went on last week and made a tremendous sermon. I thought I'd better try hard. But I've learned something over the years that it's good to be challenged and it's good to preach on a different subject you're not familiar with. It encourages you to do research, it encourages you to think and work things through. So I accepted the invitation. And so I've done copious reading and sweat and tears and frustrations. You're supposed to applaud that. <laughs> and here I am talking about fasting and prayer. Prayer is an important part of my own spiritual discipline. But fasting, I have to confess, is not. But I think that may well be the case for many here this morning. Not fasting as a part of a spiritual discipline. But I have found some very good resources. I've gathered some thoughts together and ideas to share. But fasting in this context is not going without food for a period as an exercise in dieting or slimming. That's not what fasting is about. It's not about some other sort of misunderstanding. I think um, Mr. Bean gets it right, doesn't he? I get to eat a piece of sacramental bread. That's great. That's so appropriate for coming into like COVID-1, isn't it? Just to have bread today and, and have it together. Yep. Nor is it just for fanatics, the super intensive, or spiritual giants. So what is fasting? Well, fasting is described as abstaining from food or certain food for a time. It's also an old English word which actually means a period or act of fasting. A fast is a period, so it's a noun as well. But in Christian terms, it's normally understood to be refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. And that spiritual purpose is prayer. Because fasting and prayer go together. And you picked it up in the way it was put together in Matthew. Prayer, then fasting. Fasting and prayer go together. And I already noticed something else interesting in that. Added to that is giving. But we're not talking about giving this morning. Many consider that fasting and prayer can open doors that have been closed to them. That it's a great aid that enables them to come closer to God. Fasting is very intentional. It's an intentional time to spend with God, both praying to him and listening to him without any distractions of anything else, of any food or anything else like that. Mike Bickle, an American um, evangelical Christian leader, says this, when people pray and fast, there's an increase in Holy Spirit activity. That's a challenge, isn't it? We ask the Holy Spirit to come. But do we pray for that? Do we fast for that? And maybe if the Holy Spirit doesn't seem to appear, maybe we should be looking at ourselves and saying, oh, should we be fasting and should we be praying? And of all the Christian disciplines, fast is considered to be the one of the most spiritual, spiritually powerful Christian discipline. It's a way to align our hearts to God. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 42, my thirst, my soul thirsts for the Lord, the living God. My soul thirsts for the Lord. If your soul thirsts for the Lord, ask yourself, do I need to fast if I'm not fasting as well as praying? Through fasting and prayer, the Holy Spirit can actually transform lives. We know that has happened. St. Augustine writing in... It's, it's, sorry, go back a moment. David Matthias, in a, Habits of Grace writes this, it's a means of God's grace 
to strengthen and sharpen our Godward affections. To strengthen and sharpen, to add to what we're already doing. St. Augustine, writing in the 3rd century, BC, AC, AD, says this, Fasting cleanses the soul, raises the mind, subjects one's flesh to the spirit, renders the heart contrite and humble, scatters the clouds of concupiscence or sexual desire, quenches the thirst fire of lust, and kindles the true light of chastity. That's a great interesting comment, isn't it? Cleanses the soul, raises the mind, subjects one flesh to the spirit. Very challenging comment that he makes. So the purpose of fasting, of prayer and praying, is to draw us close to God, to fix our eyes on him, to confess our sins as the Holy Spirit brings them to mind, to receive his forgiveness and renewal, to pray deeply to him and above all to listen to him. Because how often do we pray and don't listen? To listen to God speaking back to us, which so often apparently happens in, when a person is fasting. What sort of types of fast do we have? There are three types considered to be biblical. The first is a partial fast, giving up a delicacy or something like that. It's described in the book of Daniel, where for three, months he, three weeks he abstained only from delicacies like meat and wine. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? You know something? We've often practiced a spiritual fast in the Anglican Church, haven't we? You remember back in the days we did, gave up something for lead? Who gave up something for lead this year? Great, great. What did you give up, Mark? You, you gave up coffee, did you? Yes. Right. Josh, Josiah, what did you give up? Chocolate. Pardon? Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> you don't have a celebration today, do you? Just as well. <laughs> Jack. Did you, did you give up? Someone else? What did you give up? Social media Sorry? Social media well, there we are. Okay, great. Gave up something for Lynn. What happened to the others? We were not even reminded about it, were we? We should have been, probably. But that's a partial fast, where you give up something for a period of time. It's not really so common today amongst Christian circles, but I must wonder one thing. When we give up something like this, why do we do it? Do we do it because it's the thing to do? Or do we do it so we're going to come closer to God? Is it done because it's the thing to do? Oh, I've got what I've done for me, aren't I great? Gave up coffee, chocolate, whatever it was. But has that brought us closer to God? And we need to stop and say, if not, why not? Then there's a complete fast. We have water or juice only. It's often fasting for a rather extended period, it might be two or three days. Some of you can remember the 40 hours of famine. Who remember that? I'm sure most of you can remember those. That's what a, fight past, a complete fast is actually about. Three, 40 hours without food, you're allowed barley sugar, if I recall correctly, and water and or juice. But that was it. At the end of that 40 days, 40 hours, you were hungry. Though you actually would. You'd gone, probably gone past the hunger stage, hadn't you? So the 40 hour famine was a reminder of the complete fast that's being talked about. And then there's a third sort that turns up in scripture called an absolute fast, no food or water for a long period of time. Now Paul went on an absolute fast for three days following his encounter with Jesus in Acts 9. Moses and Elijah engaged in supernatural actual absolute fast of 40 days in Deuteronomy and 1 Kings. But there is a very, very crucial warning about these sort of fasts. They must not be undertaken without great care and only under the guidance of a physician, because the body can only go so long without water. And I was talking to a doctor this morning, the first service, and he said, that's absolutely right. 
do not touch complete fast unless you are under a physician's direction who can monitor it and all those sort of things with it. So there's those three partial fasts, which are quite easy, relatively easy to do, complete fast, and totally an absolute fast, as also Jesus did. We'll come back to that. So what's the Bible got to say about fasting? Well, it's mentioned throughout the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, and it's mentioned as something that God's people do. Prayer and fasting seems to be assumed as normal and important in our personal lives and corporately together as a church. In the Old Testament, we read of fasting on the Day of Atonement, the day that the people's sinners are dealt with by a sacrifice. Atonement is necessary because God and humanity are hopelessly estranged by humanity's sin with no way back from the people's side. Only God can bring people back to him. And if you listen to that reading this morning from Isaiah, I'm going to come back to it for a moment or two. Verses 3 particularly. Why have you fasted and you have not seen it? And they say, why have you humbled yourselves and talked to the Lord and have not noticed and then the Lord goes on and says this, Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please. That's hardly fasting, is it? And exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and in struggling each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast that I have chosen, asked the Lord, on a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? That's a blunt reminder of the problems we have. Yes, we fast, but why do we do it? And the Lord asks the people of Israel's time that very, very question. Why do you do that and what's it about? In Old Testament times, the way back to God was a way by way of animal sacrifices. And by the time of exile, we actually pick up that there were four different animal fasts which were observed. The Old Testament speaks of corporate fasting, the whole body of church, the whole body of the people fasting. Observing a, f a fast together. Nehemiah talks about fasting. So he had a favour from the king. He fasted so he could go to the king and ask a favour so he could have the access to get back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He asked for the favour from the king. David asked God to intervene through a fast because of injustice. And he also, he fasted for healing and miraculous intervention with a sick child. As I said before, Daniel did that far, partial fast, giving up wine and meat. For three weeks. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? For some of us, giving up wine and meat. We read that Mordecai and the Jews, human, uh, Haman had a wicked plot to get rid and exterminate the Jews. And they found out about it. And they prayed, they fasted, and they prayed. And as we know, Haman got his comeuppance. And Moses and Elijah engaged in spiritual Super, absolute fast of 40 days, the same length of time that Jesus fasted in the wilderness. And this fast mentioned in other places like Ezra and Esther and Je uh, Jonah with regular fastings going on. So it was certainly a part of the Old Testament features, a common feature of God's people in the Old Testament times. In the New Testament, it's not mentioned as much. We come across it particularly the first time Jesus fast in the wilderness. Right at the start of his ministry, he'd been baptised, and then he's led out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And this, if we stop and think about it, eventually led to Jesus to become the one and all sufficient sacrifice for our sins. The scriptures seem to imply that at Jesus' fast in the wilderness, there was no food available in the place of temptation. Maybe that was why the devil offered him bread. In the Gospel reading from Matthew 6, Jesus himself makes a specific reference to both fasting and prayer, which was a personal discipline for him. 
And he seems to assume that his hearers and followers would fast and pray. He taught that when they fast to face God, focus on God, and not on people or other things. It also implies that fasting and prayer are intrinsically linked with the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And the cross of Christ will never be understood unless it's seen that in the cross, Christ, the Saviour, was dealing with the sins of all humanity by this once-for-all sacrifice of himself. And for Jesus, it's clear that fasting and prayer were powerful weapons in the wilderness. And so Jesus is not saying to us, look, if you feel like it, you go and fast. If you feel like it, go and pray. He actually says something else. Did you pick up what he said? When you fast. When you pray. Surely he has an expectation that both prayer and fasting are a part of following Jesus. And we read also in the New Testament, the disciples prayed and fasted. And throughout history, the people of God have cried out to Jesus in fasting and prayer for forgiveness of sins, for breakthrough, for deliverance, for guidance. And in more modern times even, prayer and fasting have become, been the response of a whole nation in times of trouble. There's a great example of this. In 1940, King George VI called a national day of prayer and many people fasted. And it's recorded that there were incredible changes in conditions immediately following this. So having established that prayer and fasting is biblical, why fast? Well, there's a number of good reasons. For closeness to God. For blessing, we'd undertake responsibility. For spiritual breakthrough. For deliverance from recurring sin, for revival, for repentance, for the lost, for wisdom and guidance and decisions, for guidance for our future, for special needs and challenges, for people who we love and care for, marriage, children, family, friends, for our church, leaders, events and needs. Huge list when you think about it. Some of the things that the prayer people are fasting for along with prayer. As I said before, fasting and prayer are intrinsically linked. And as I said before also, many Christians find that prayer is enhanced by fasting. That they can focus more clearly on their prayer if they are not distracted by all the concerns about food and sustenance. No having to go and get the food ready. No having to worry about it's going to, what time we're going to have dinner today or lunch or something like that. They're not concerned about that. Their focus is on the Lord. Do you know Satan hates it when we pray and he hates it when we fast? And he'll do everything he can to pull us away from this. And when we feel the enemy trying to discourage us, the best thing we do is immediately go to God in prayer and possibly fasting and ask him to strengthen our resolve in the face of difficulties and temptations. And prayer and fasting can bring us into a new closeness with God and a greater sensitivity to spiritual things. The enemy makes us a target because he knows that both prayer and fasting are such powerful Christian disciplines as God may have something very special to show us as we wait upon him and seek his face. And the Satan absolutely hates that happening. He does not want us to grow in faith. He does not want us to pray. He does not want us to fast. And he will do anything he can to stop us from doing this. If we're fasting, he'll probably make us hungry and grumpy without food. He'll bring up some trouble, remind you of something you don't want to know about. You know, trouble in our family, at work, or in our life. Anything he can to stop us. And I'm sure when it comes to fasting, you're not having a meal, he says, hey, come on, Eric, it's time to go and eat. That mind, that's the mindset we, he works on. But here's the good news. Prayer is a productive shield against such attacks. Prayer is a productive shield against such attacks, or should be prayer and fasting. Andrew Bonner, a minister from Scotland, simply says, fasting is abstaining from anything that hinders prayer. So what hinders prayer? Fasting is abstaining from anything that hinders prayer. If we fast and pray, it's not necessarily a mountaintop experience. It may just be an awareness of a nearness to God that we have never known before. 
But above all, the motive and fasting must always be to glorify God, not to have an emotional experience and not to obtain personal happiness. And when the motives are right, God will honour the seeking heart and bless the time spent with him. So that brings us to the final part, to fast or not to fast, that is the question. There's a book called St Augustine's Prayer Book. It's a prayer book published by the Order of the Holy Cross, which is an Anglican monastic community in the States. Now for me, this particular comment I'm going to show you puts fasting and prayer into a perspective. Because as one who has not practiced fast, fasting, but prayer, I can certainly relate to this. And this is what was said. Fasting uni means not more than a light breakfast, one full meal, and one half meal of the 40 days of Lent. And gee, I could go with that. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? That's what it suggested. Uh, that's intermittent fasting. Pardon? That's intermittent fasting. Partial. Well, this authority of St. Augustine's prayer book <laughs> indicated that. I could go with that. Now, you may not. You may say, that's not enough. That's fine. It also adds something else. It says that abstinence means to refrain from some particular type of food or drink, starting from meat on Fridays in Lent or through the year, except in the season of Christmas and Easter. And it's common, as we've ticked up before, to undertake some particular form of abstinence, which you were talking about before, giving this up, giving that up, during the entire season of Lent. And this self-discipline may be helpful at other times as an act of solidarity with those who are in need as a bodily expression of prayer. So back to that question. Should you fast? Only you can answer that question, because I cannot answer it for you. Only you can answer that question for yourself. If you feel you should be fasting, please talk to the Lord about it. Lord, please show me how. Please show me how to go through this and work it out and do the things I need to do. But as you do that, let's come back to Isaiah's words. Fasting with a humble heart and righteous behaviour pleases God, which is a summary of those first verses of Isaiah reading. This is God speaking there. And then look at verse 9. After you've done that, then you will call and the Lord will answer and will, you'll cry, and will cry, for, you'll cry for help and he will say, here I am. The Lord will call and the Lord will answer your cry for help. And he will say, here I am. That's some thoughts and ideas on fasting. It is something you need to work out if you feel you're challenged by this. Work it without, with yourself and with God. Because I don't think there's anyone can say, definitely you should do it this way or that way or that way. It's individual. Because we're all individual people, we're different people. We have different approaches and different attitudes. And some of us actually quite like food. I see a few heads nodding. <laughs> May God bless you as you consider these issues. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.